Really the only way to start the conversation as we think together about all of those things and more and suffering and well-being is to begin by asking each person, how are you maintaining your well-being this week? This past week, um, like many other weeks um, over the course of this past year, I think is um, filled with different types of ups and downs. I have kids and trying to manage um, what the next few weeks or days look like um, can be challenging sometimes with kids. But I'm also grateful this past week and I try to practice gratefulness in terms of where we are as a physician looking at where we are right now with the vaccine distribution versus um, where we thought we would be even a year from now um, is a positive uh, piece of news to, um, to reflect on. So I think like many other weeks, this week has been full of reflecting on the positives, but also um, engaging with um, the uncertainties um, that's before me. I would um, echo, I think, a lot of what um, Ranka said. I also have children and I find myself um, looking to them a lot. Um, our younger child um, this week sort of spontaneously started dancing and it was this moment where I found for like a brief second um, I could set aside all the things that had been distracting me. Um, you know, there's like a, there's been a wheel spinning in the back of my head for the last 15 months, thinking about COVID, worrying about COVID. In the last couple of weeks, um, the part of my brain that uh, pays attention to Israel-Palestine was, you know, sped up. Um, but for a moment, he was like jumping around and waving his arms. And for a moment, it was all okay, because we were so present. And that's really what, what I took from him, um, that every now and then you can set aside all of the, the concerns and the worries and all of that and just be fully present with the people who are right in front of you. And then that gives you energy to turn back to the work that you need to do. So I'm trying to hold on to that, that moment. Thank you so much. And now I get to ask my my colleague, Chaplain Tara, how are you right now and how have you been maintaining your well being this week? Well, thank you. Um, salam, everyone. Shalom. Namaskar. Sasakal. Moju. Um, good evening. I, um, first of all, I'm so grateful for this space. I want to thank Veritas for continuing to organize these conversations that I think are really bridge building and allow us to sit together in both times of joy and the challenges. And I think create opportunities for um, listening. So thank you so much. And thank you, Reverend Kristen. It's a, always a joy to have you uh, facilitate good conversations. So thank you. Um, I'm gonna echo a little bit of what both Dr. Pedersen and, and um, my friend Claire you know, just shared uh, that I think we're all sitting in crisis all around us and there's grief and loss all around us. Um, I first wanna recognize that I am a person of faith. So my meditative practices um, in terms of my own salah that I do as a Muslim to connect with the divine um, and to, to center myself and allow for a time for there to be a focus in my life that has been fundamental. Um, I would also, you know, I don't have children, but I'm really feeling like my Northwestern students are my children right now. And although I'm, you know, trying to create those, those boundaries, but I, I, I can, I can feel that sense of empathy, right? Um, but I also want to recognize that it is their resilience as well that I think allows for me to breathe um, and say, okay, you know, how, how do we, how do we pull this all together? So just echoing some of what was shared and also that um, the meditation and mindfulness that I practice through my own faith tradition of Islam and Sufism with the Sawaf, I think that if I don't do that, I don't know where I would be, to be honest. Um, it helps ground me, it helps me heal through uh, all the difficulties. So thanks. <laughs> 
Thank you so much. And I'll invite you to stay, uh, stay on the screen here and invite all of our panelists to join together for our conversation and really appreciate those real answers from all of you as we begin. When we um, enter our conversation now about, about suffering and well-being, I want to just highlight that um, everyone is speaking from their own perspective and their own embodied reality. And we have such a wonderful gathering of um, women here who are practitioners, who are scholars, who live and think deeply through their multiple intersectional identities. And what a privilege and honor it is to be in this space with all of you this evening. I'm gonna, with that as a little more context, get really into a question that so many folks ask and what has really prompted this forum tonight. Um, so from your own perspective, what is suffering and how has it shaped you and your community? So that's the question that we begin with. Well, it's actually our second question after how, how, how are you? From your perspective, what is suffering? And how has it shaped you and your community? And I'll invite whoever would like to go first to respond to that. So when I think about suffering from my perspective, I think about pain and I think about pain in the different intersections, if I can use that word too, of who we are as human beings, who I am as a human being. So I think of this idea of body, soul, spirit, and how it is um, described in different religious views. Um, but even when we're thinking about um, the biological, there's this idea in mental health care of the biopsychosocial I like to extend that and talk about the biopsychosocial spiritual. Um, so when I'm processing through what suffering looks like, you know, through my perspective, whether for myself or for those around me, for my patients, I'm identifying a lot of times pain, um, whether it's pain in the body, um, which causes suffering in a more direct sense where we can sort of see it. Um, obviously we can't quantify pain very well, or whether that's suffering in terms of the psychological and what some of us might describe as the spiritual. And I think uh, just to echo what Chaplain um, Tehira said, this idea of um, then what you do to um, process that suffering sort of follows that idea of the, you know, if you're having biological pain, you're looking for a biological source of that pain and you want to um, correct whatever it is in one way or the other. But I think when it comes to more psychological pain, we have a lot more difficulty in mental health care identifying right exactly where that psychological pain is coming from. So in summary, when I think about suffering, you know, from my perspective, I really think that it cuts through every aspect of what it means in some ways to be human and what it means to approach the human body. Wow, thank you. Some language that I found incredibly helpful there. Bio, psycho, social, spiritual. That's really, really, really powerful. Chapman Tahara, from your perspective, what is suffering and how has it shaped you and your community? Yeah, I was just really enjoying listening to Dr. Peterson and I'm, I'm definitely gonna coin that uh, bio, psycho, social, spiritual. I love that, thank you so much. Well, um, I, you know, I have to pause and think through how I answer this because as someone who is trained in theology, my mind, you know, immediately races to like conversations around theodicy and, you know, um, the idea of free will and the questions around, well, if there's a God, then why is there suffering? And like, I'm just going to acknowledge, right, that that's an immediate kind of um, response that I often have when I'm thinking about this, because this is often where some of the anecdotal experiences with those who do come to me around this, um, that those are some of the underlying questions that they're asking. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna first acknowledge that um, I'm speaking from my reading of the tradition. And 
what I understand to be something that informs my own um, ex experience, I suppose. So um, the word actually suffering within the Quranic text is literally enam, which means pain. And there's lots of you know theologians who argue like, well, what 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 was the purpose of suffering? What is the purpose of pain? Um, and why do good people have bad things happen to them? So that I think is a continued question in theology. And there's like, you know, and, and that's true of philosophy too, right? You all know that this is like predates Socrates, right? The, this and Aristotle, and these are questions constantly being asked. And one thing that I think has helped been helpful um, to recognize uh, within the, at least the pre-Islamic Arabian context is that while the pre-Islamic Arabs believed in a higher power, they did not believe in an afterlife. So essentially what the Quran introduces for its time and space is that all this, whatever you're doing and you're getting away with because of the power and privilege that you have, you will be questioned for it. So the, the idea of, well, if there is suffering, whatever the reasons are for it, there's an introduction to this idea that all of this will be brought to justice at some point even if there's no perfect justice here in this world, and you are all going to be tested based on how you care for each other and how you respond to each other. So suffering is often see, seen then as an opportunity. It's seen as an opportunity for, um, and I know this, this is hard, right? Like it's, it's especially for, for those of us who are going through that uh, and, and depending on the degree of that. And I love what Dr. Peterson said about like, how do you, how do you like, define on a scale of one to 10, when you, when you go to the doctor's office, yeah, they say like on a scale of one to 10, 10, tell us where your pain is. But when you're, when you're suffering because of, uh, you know, the social justice um, or human rights violations, it's, it's a very different type of suffering uh, because it gets embodied in, in the lives of people. So I guess if, if there was a short answer, doctor, or not doctor, sorry, Reverend Kristen, um, it's seen in theology as an opportunity for gratitude and to uh, uphold the principles that um, and, and the morals of a community. On the other hand, it's also um, left for you know the discretion of of people to to think about what this actually means for themselves and see if there's a way to improve whatever it is that they've gone through. And this is, I, I mean, somewhat true of uh, traumatic when when traumatic stress there's an opportunity there as well right? for growth. There's act, an actual growth that happens after PTSD. So um, I don't know if that kind of covered both the theology as well as like some of the cultural um, realizations that are occurring within it. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate even um, your response in voicing that this is a question that so many of our, student community, but people in general ask why, what does this mean? If there is, you know, if there is insert acts, if there's divinity, if there's um, goodness, why is there suffering? So I appreciate you really naming that, um, helping us think through that through, through your theological lens. Claire, I would invite you to reflect on the same question. What is suffering? Um, how has it shaped you and your community? And also invite you to respond to anything that our yeah, colleagues yeah. have said. I, well, I feel very lucky to, to be the third to answer, to answer the question because I can build on um, what's already been said. You know, if I could show you my, my sheet of uh, notes here, I have the notes I jotted down before we began and then they're all crossed out and circled around uh, with arrows to, to things that have been said before me. You know, in the Jewish tradition, and I should say, you know, I'm a, a professor, a scholar of, of of Judaism, meaning, you know, I'm sort of trained to take a historical approach and um, so on and so forth, but I'm also Jewish and part of a Jewish community and so on and so forth. And, you know, so I, you'll see that I, I am always in these kinds of settings going back and forth. And for me, they're very much inseparable. So um, with that in mind, you know, I also think when I think about what suffering means for um, for Jews or for the Jewish community or within the Jewish tradition, I also 
think very much theologically and you know Judaism is very much a textual tradition with you know a, a bible and then layer upon layer of interpretation it's also very much a what we call a multivocal tradition so for every interpretation there's an interpretation that completely disagrees with it and even when you know some interpretations are favored um, the opposite interpretations are still are still preserved and, and you know maybe we could even say canonized so that there's a lot of pluses about that it makes it very hard if not impossible to say Judaism says and then make a claim that's you know for all for all of Judaism but one of the tensions I think that Judaism as it's developed has to when we think about suffering is um, that some suffering is collective and some suffering is individual. And even if you just look at the Jewish Bible, right, when um, you know, the Jewish Bible describes this relationship between God and you know, sort of the ancestors of the, of the Jewish people today, the, the Israelites, as they're known in biblical times, where you know if the Israelites do what God wants, they're supposed to be rewarded, and if they don't do what God wants, they're going to be cursed and punished. And it's this very straightforward, um, almost quid pro kind of relationship. And just you know, it's you don't get this in the English translation, but every single description of blessing and curse is in the plural. It's you plural, all of you together. And that paradigm of sort of the collective relationship and also of blessing and curse, um, Jews have had that to turn to for better and for worse at moments of collective suffering throughout Jewish history. And there have been times when it's been, um, when people have, you know, leaders have said we're, you know, we've been exiled because of our sins. One thing that's interesting, and this is um, something I deal with in my own research and in my teaching, is that actually in the wake of the Holocaust, a lot of those answers um, outside of sort of the most traditional Jewish communities, that those answers have largely been rejected, that this cannot be punishment for sin. Within the Bible, we also though have the book of Job, right, which is the individual completely alone in his suffering and why does he suffer from most? I mean, he suffers horribly physically and he loses all of his wealth and he loses everything you know that he had thought he could count on. I would say he suffers in every category, the bio, the, the, the I had the list somewhere, the, the psycho and so on and so forth. But ultimately in some ways it's really the spiritual that is the most devastating to him, which is that it doesn't fit with his notion of God. He's been a good person why you know did all of his children die and he lost all of his cattle and he's you know broken out in boils and at the end of the book the answer is like you'll just never understand and so we have that strain in Judaism as well right you and this actually Tara this picks up um Chaplain Tara picks up on what you were saying which is this this notion that in our world it won't be just because God's justice is beyond our understanding in a lot of ways, that's where Jewish ideas of an afterlife or a messianic redemption, that's where they begin to develop with this sort of promise that there will eventually be some kind of justice. But, but this world is not, we're not going to understand really what's going on um, in this world. Uh, I just want to say one more um, quick thing, if you don't mind. Um, and that is that there's um, room in the Jewish tradition as well, and I, I think that this is important for our anger, for being angry about suffering. And, and sometimes that, that that sort of righteous anger, righteous indignation, um, I don't want to say that it's unique to Judaism, but it, there's a, a distinct strain. Not everybody knows about it. It's not always stressed, but you can see it across time, sort of people protesting God. It goes back to Job even. Um, and what you see a lot less compared to some traditions is the notion that suffering is redemptive, right? That suffering is there to make you a better person. You know what, sometimes, sometimes you just suffer. Um, and sometimes a whole group just suffers and it doesn't make them better people. And it's sometimes God gives you more than you can handle. And um, that can be very frustrating, I think, for people that there aren't resources to help you find meaning in your suffering. There are, you know, 
there's just sort of a, a realistic this this is it and what are you going to do within you know the constraints of your life to make your life better to make the world better to make others better um it's something that you know i I'm often surprised, and then I really will stop, when I have students in class who aren't from Jewish backgrounds who encounter this aspect of Judaism for the first time, um, we're very surprised by it because it's it's not necessarily so helpful or so, so uh, yeah. I, I, again, I appreciate this so much. I, as you were speaking, I was just thinking about lament, right? Like, so what is the tradition of lament? And Raka, if I might ask you this, what are the consequences if we are not to our bodies, to, you know, biopsychosocial, spiritual, if we don't engage in lament, what happens? Is there a physical reaction? Yeah, you know, there's so much to chew on in everything that has been said um, so far, but in terms of um, lament, you know, I think lament certainly has a spiritual energy behind it, like a, you know, more religious, in my case, um, based on my, uh, Christian background, more of a biblical um, uh, connotation to it. But I think when you think about something like therapy, right, it's almost like a space where you can come in and, and lament and talk about the, the pain or the suffering that you've been experiencing and not feel like you have to filter it through a lens of I'm okay, which is what we tend to do um, to people around us. We tend to put on a face that we're fine, we're okay. Um, but to confess and to say that I'm not okay, that I'm not doing well, and that I'm in pain and I'm suffering, um, it, it is both, you know, a therapeutic action, but also a spiritual action of, it, in some ways, it's sort of like you can't get help if you don't admit, right, um, the state that you're in, whatever that is. Um, you know, I think about as uh, both uh, Claire and um, Chaplain Tahira um, have been talking, I've been thinking about this idea of the acute and the chronic um, idea of suffering. And so this idea that, you know, we're hoping for something better. And in many religions, there's this, you know, other life and other thing <laughs> that you can aspire to. So no matter how terrible and chronic your suffering is, maybe on the other side of it, you have some relief. But I also think from a biological perspective, sometimes that idea has been used to ignore the physical present acute suffering um, with this idea of um, it'll get better later. Um, and, and I don't say that to diminish the value, you know, as a Christian myself, um, of, um, of this uh, Messiah, um, in our case, that Jesus would come back. Um, but I, I do say it because I see it often in my practice that sometimes in that process, there's less focus on the here and now and the present experience one is having. And the fact that there's this idea of salvation as it is happening now in sort of the Christian story and salvation as it will happen in the future on the other side. Um, and the hope is that, you know, there can be some relief, you know, from the acute, the here and now suffering, as well as the chronic one that I think to be human and to, and to experience in our individual ways. Go ahead, Claire, what did you wanna, did you want to no, say something? Yeah, you know, I'm just thinking. Um, I actually want to, in some ways, to go back to a comment, um, Ranka, that you made earlier about. Um, I'm just thinking about sort of moments of trauma in my own life that have passed, you know, that no longer cause me suffering, but that at the time that they happened and for some period afterwards, um, caused great suffering, you know, the kind of trauma where it felt you need about me was that that happened in ways. And um, I think a lot about narrative and for me that part of sort of overcoming trauma or overcoming suffering um, is learning to 
to incorporate it into your story um, of who you are and of this thing that that happened to you or that you know shaped you so that you can say and here's who I am now and there's that moment when you can tell that story and you're no longer sort of solidly in it and I think in many ways religious traditions offer us stories um, where we see people I mean they don't use our language necessarily and um, they don't have all of our medical concepts or our concepts period um, but there is something about the telling of stories that I think in in many religious communities we're really trained in and learn to do and then learn to shape our own selves as narrative as narrative selves that are part of this larger story. Yeah, that that really leads us into a next question, um, and I appreciate so much how the the conversation is going there. So, in the midst of suffering, um, how do we continue given this reality? How, how do we continue both individually and community? What do we do? in the suffering. I think before we even delve into like, what do we do with this suffering? I think, I think it's important to recognize like who we are in our stories. And I just like love what Claire just said about, you know, we have to be able to sit in the, the pain because as you know, like I know uh, Dr. Peterson, you just mentioned how it could be therapeutic to be in the moment of salvation now, like the way I, the way you fr framed it. I just love that too. Um, so how do you, you know, how do you go through that pain when, or how do you move forward without going through the pain? And we know that therapists teach us, right? You have to go through it. And, um, you know, I, I know that sharing the sharing of our stories can be really healing um, because it recognizes like, roots and and in a history um and it also i think in that process gives and I, it frames how a how a community understands their own narrative as well as their pathology right so it's 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 really important to understand narratives, and I love that Claire brought this up. Um, and and as I reflect on this, Reverend Kristen, um, you know, I'm ethnically, and if it's okay, right? Like I think I wanted to share what that story is like for I think there's 1.6 billion Muslims in the world, and I can't speak on behalf of all of them. Um, but what I can say is that at least for someone like me who's ethnically Indian um, and part of a uh, generation of Indian Americans who um, came to this country because of uh, one of the largest displacements, right, and known to humanity, to history. Uh, so like my grandfather was part of um, the, the India-Pakistan partition, and where 30 million, close to 30 million people were displaced. And I think what that suffering did to my father's older, like older brothers and some of my uncles, um, was a distancing from religion and faith because of that suffering. Um, so like my father's honestly one of the only practicing brothers out of the, uh, out of the four in his family. And I've, I've tried to understand what that suffering has done when it comes to the, the intersection of faith and identity for, for many of uh, the elders uh, in my family. And I think because they witness the kind of horror uh, like, you know, the raping of, of women, um, little children dying right in front of them, that I think it had such a psychological impact on them. And, but my grandfather was one of those who stayed, right? He believed in this idea of like building community and, and, and engagement and all of that. So um, when I think my family and many of the uh, immigrants coming from South Asia, uh, as we've come to the United States, I think there's you, you have, like there's no way to just like dismiss that part of that part of that story and re-engaging with what does what does it mean to be of these different intersectional identities that we hold um and still say okay i'm muslim but often having to say and i think my students experience this as well is 
like often I've grown up in, and my own experience of suffering has been, I've had to share with people what Islam is not than what it is over and over and over and over again. And that can be, uh, that can have a huge impact, I think, on, on mental health. It can have, have a huge impact on whether I want to choose to be Muslim or not anymore. Um, and so when we think collectively about this question, Reverend Christian, it's, Reverend Kristen, sorry, um, it's about understanding where people are coming from. And some are still sitting in that trauma. And, and, and I think it begins with validating that trauma. And then those of us who are in places of power and privilege, then I think those are those spaces that we can begin to say, okay, what can we do collectively and, and still be able to honor those who are still sitting in that place of trauma, if that makes sense. Um, because I, I think it's disingenuous to ask those who have gone through like a history, right, of, of, drip, of deep trauma to continue to ask them to, then to say, okay, well, uh, could you just like forget everything that's happened to you as, as a people, as a nation, as, um, as a global community and uh, let's just all find a silver lining. And I think that that's what I wanna recognize is that healing has to be a process and, and we have to allow people to grow at the pace that they can. Thank you so much for share, sharing that. Does someone, anyone want to respond? Ronka, it looks like you maybe were going to respond. You're such a great moderator. You're like watching all the subtle movements. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think the maybe one piece of um, what I appreciate everything you said, um, Chaplain um, Tahira. I think one piece of that, um, in terms of narratives and stories, I think about um, being a Black woman and um, and our conversations around racism in this past year, and all the conversations I've had with. Um, family and friends who identify as Black, um, and, and this 400-year-old suffering um, attached to um, the color of one's skin, which is not a biological construct as much as a social construct. Um, and I think about you know sleepless nights that I had um, uh, in terms of following George Floyd's, you know, murder, I think about my sons and um, being black men and growing up in this country and the suffering that I cannot protect them from, um, even if I wanted to. And I could have all the degrees in the world and still would not be able to protect them from that suffering. So um, I think there's certainly ways in which, you know, what uh, was just said about we just said, uh, Chaplain, to hear about sitting in it because I can't ignore it. I can't just say, let go, you know, let go of it. If anything, um, sometimes it is suffering that forces us to seek out justice, right? Um, it is actually encountering it, seeing it, and and I and I, you know, will venture to say that one of the reasons justice has been so slow, you know, for black people in this country is because there was this apathy around seeing other people suffering and pain. And so in many ways, you know, while we want to not feel pain and not feel any kind of suffering, it's, it's almost like having, you know, wound on your arm and ignoring it and expecting it will go away. It will, it won't go away, it'll, you know, become infected, you know, cause, um, sepsis and eventually it kills the person, right? If it's untreated. Um, and, and so I, I think there's something there about this idea of narratives and stories, you know, that is so um, key and essential and really how a lot of our um, religious views are kind of centered around stories um, and around meaning that comes out of suffering. And, it, and it's sort of like you start with the suffering and then you're telling the story and then eventually you're saying something about what the outcome of that suffering was. And we're continuously telling that story because even though 300 years ago, you know, people um, 
in this country were treated very badly and killed and treated like cattle, right? Um, that we say, the Black women in academia that I talk to sometimes, that we stand on the shoulders, right, of these people, the, these women, these men who came before us. And so in some ways, it's like our story creates meaning, right, in their suffering. And, and I think that's part of this idea of, you know, the story never quite ends, even with the person, just like it didn't end with George Floyd. Go ahead, Claire, right. yes. Okay, um, I, I thank you both. Um, it's been really, it's very, you're, I really appreciate both of you. Um, I, I, I'm, the response that I, that I wanna share is, um, it's a little bit indirect, um, but hopefully uh, the connection is, will be, will make sense to people other than me. But I keep thinking about um, when I, so my, my father's parents um, were immigrants. My, my grandfather was um, a survivor of the Holocaust. Uh, my grandmother um, had come over in the 30s, um, but uh, everybody else uh, was killed by the Nazis. Um, and I think about when I, so when I was getting married, my father said to me, he said, look, my parents, they made it to America. They lived, they had children. And he looked at me, he said, it was only, I'm the oldest grandchild. He said, it was only when you were born that they really started to breathe. They really started to feel like it was going to be okay. And it made a, a really big impression on me. He said that to him, he was like this transitional generation. And um, to be in America, three, three generations to in our family history was very meaningful. Um, but what I want to talk about actually, you know, weddings are a moment of, of transition, but also having children is a moment of transition. And um, so I'm a, a Jew of Ashkenazi background, of Eastern European background, and among Ashkenazi Jews, the tradition is that you usually name your children for someone who's died. And um, so I'm thinking about this image of, you know, rising on the shoulders of those who came before us and of um, our, I guess my, our second child is, is the star of my stories tonight, but when we named um, Ethan, our, our son, um, his middle name is for um, a cousin, um, a cousin and a great uncle of mine who um, survived, they escaped with my grandfather. And I remember struggling with giving these, giving him their names because what was, what from their lives did I want to pass on. Um, they were really, they had suffered horribly. They were damaged human beings because of what they had lost in their suffering. I mean, they had difficult marriages. They were difficult parents. In my mind, um, if you know the, the book, Where the Wild Things Are, Maurice Sendak, the author, described that the monsters in that book, they were like the Holocaust survivors who he knew growing up. That's always resonated with me because my cousin and my great uncle were like that. They were loving. I knew they loved me, but they were also deeply frightening people. Um, and so I, I think about that moment of you know bringing a new child into the world and wanting this deep connection to history. And um, you know we sometimes talk about it, and and um, I don't know whether the, the science actually proves this or not, but sometimes these like pseudo biological terms about intergenerational or inherited trauma, but whether or not that's actually in our genes, right? We bring with us these stories as well and we pass on these names. Um, and I think, you know, it's just, it, it always for me has been, has been, I hold the complicated nature of the connection, but also wanting to sever the connection sometimes and to say, it is a new generation. It is a new moment. We have repaired, we will repair. It will get better. It is better. All of this all at once. You know, I wanna be this kind of optimistic person. Um, I was struck though, um, Tara, about um, what you're saying about that some people in your family found strength 
in faith and others found strength in rejecting faith. Um, and for some, you know, it's the act of rejecting religion or rejecting, you know, a certain form of religion or whatever that is deeply empowering. And I think, you know, I think we need to recognize that in an interfaith conversation that all kinds of relationships with faith um, exist. And uh, that's, you know, the, the, as being something to reject, faith is also important in that way. And also the family stories are long um, and from generation to generation, you know, we have faith as a resource. I may have it, my children may not. I may have it, my brother may not or vice versa. And even over the course of a lifetime, your relationship changes and sometimes the resources resonate and other times they don't. Um, and that's okay. Well, I, th there's so much richness here. Um, we're gonna transition in a moment to questions from folks who are watching, but I wanna say in my own uh, ministry practice and um, identity, I, I think one of the most sacred things is to see and hear and witness people inside the truth of their own life. So what an enormous honor it has been um, to be in conversation with all of you and for you to offer your witness as you are, as the people you are. Uh, thank you so much. And I know that there will, um, we could we could keep talking for a long, long time. So what we'll do now is turn the conversation towards the folks who are watching and I will invite Sarah and Priscilla who are our student um, moderators to come on and, and bring questions. So welcome Sarah. Oh, I'm sorry, Sarah and Elise, welcome. They have matching backgrounds as you can see and it's pretty cool. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you all so much for such a wonderful and rich conversation. Um, I'm really looking forward to now going through some of these questions, I think they're really fascinating in hearing what you all have to say. Um, so this first question is, how do we balance a recognition of collective and individual suffering when comforting someone? It can seem to diminish suffering by saying, I feel that too. But recognizing that you're not alone in suffering can also be emotionally valuable. Yeah, so I think what how do we make that balance internally as we're in communication with someone who is having a hard time? Um, I mean, I think kind of uh, practical level, um, it's important to listen. Sometimes people give you a sense of what they need um, and to not come with a a preconceived idea of what the person needs. Um, it does help if you know the person a little bit, if you're talking to an individual, um, but that might not always be the case. But um, one thing, one example I can give that might be very practical to a question like this might not be, you know, why the question was asked is if someone is grieving the loss of a family member, for example, and you say, you come, to them and say, oh, you know, I lost the family member too. Um, sometimes in that moment might not be the time to sort of say, I know exactly how you feel because the truth is people, you know, deserve that sort of sacred space of being able to fully experience what they're experiencing without um, necessarily sharing all of it with others. I mean, it's helpful to validate people's feelings and tell them that, you know, um, this is a terrible loss, but you probably don't want to say, <laughs> I know exactly how you feel. Um, uh, you can share stories, but I think one has to be careful just about that I, that phrase of, I know exactly how you feel. It's, it's almost better to say things like, um, you know, this must be really difficult and um, I, I can only imagine or, you know, how you feel just because sometimes people just, we really need to respect that sacred moment in which people are experiencing pain and suffering and not um, make it about ourselves. I think that's really good advice. Um, I think there's also, um, 
this question also makes me think about sometimes we can help people to make sense of the relationship between their individual experience and a collective experience. So, you know, the example of um, grieving for somebody in your family who's died, um, you know, I agree a hundred percent that it's impossible that you're feeling exactly, that you understand exactly what somebody is feeling. And that's also not a helpful thing to say. But for example, in the context of COVID or a pandemic, when so many people are losing or have lost loved ones to the same disease, um, I think there's space to say, you know, to recognize that, to recognize that the individual pain that people are feeling is part of a larger phenomenon or it fits into a larger problem. Um, and there are the moments to get up and, you know, to fight the, the, the whether it's, you know, injustice or to go out and sign people up to get vaccinated, you know, whatever it is, there are moments to fight the larger problematic situation. But um, I think sometimes just in the, in the, before that moment of getting up to fix things, it can be very powerful to help people make sense of their grief as part of a larger, a larger pattern. Um, you know, one thing that I've learned being on faculty also is that uh, my students don't need to comfort me. That's not why they're there. But as an adult in their lives, um, I, I can play a role for them that a parent might have when they were younger or that other adults can play. Um, but I think it's really important to be aware of those relationships that there, you know, there are times when you're speaking to someone who needs your help and they are not there to help you. You may have a lot of pain, but there's somebody else for you to turn to. Um, and that for me was a understanding that and now acting on it was a big part of sort of, you know, growing up and growing into the role um, of being um, an adult on a college campus. I think Claire, Professor Claire um, and Dr. Peterson both covered, I think, the things that I was uh, thinking about. Um, the only thing I would add is that I find that sometimes faith communities offer some guidance around bereavement, and that could be helpful, right? So um, within world traditions, there's um, you know some level of guidance around. Well, you know, if someone passes away, for example, right? There are rites and rituals that are offered to the community. Um, and the community will often come together and create that space. And, um, you know, some would argue that in the Muslim tradition, it's, there's a guidance that if you wanted to sit in, in actually the actual pain, that there's a three day period to just sit there in that pain. Um, but beyond that, then there's an encouragement to rise, like physically rise, like bring your body to just stand up and um, be more present to the world around you. And that's, that's seen as more of a guidance. Um, obviously there's, you know, difference of opinion on this in terms of what the trauma um, would like, what the trauma is like. Um, and so I think that that actually can help with the healing process as well in, in ways that um, recognize both the particularism of, of the pain that's being experienced, but then how like collective impact of a community and the guidance of a faith can help as well through the process. Can I just jump in really quickly and just add, um, cause um, Chaplain Tara, you reminded me there's a wonderful Jewish tradition after a close relative dies, you stay in your home for a period of seven days and people come and visit you. But one of the custom I wanna really highlight is that when people come to visit you, the visitor doesn't get to start the conversation. Right? The visitor just waits for the mourner to start the conversation. And I think that's um, a great metaphor of, you know, you show up for the person who's suffering and then you sit with them until they're ready to talk. Okay, I'm just gonna lift a second question um, from the audience. Um, this one says, theologizing and philosophizing on suffering while indispensable and important processes have often been blind to the lived experiences of marginalized or relegated communities. 
How can we better ground our abstract understanding in the vivid truths of real suffering? One of a little bit of like a life project is to stop seeing theologizing and philosophizing as something that belong to um, people who are, you know, who are elites. Basically, I think that um, I don't think that that reflecting on one's life is something that should be limited to the college classroom or to books or whatever. And I think um, that uh, those of us who, I just think there, there needs to be space for everybody to, to speak the truth of their life. And that means some of us need to shut up sometimes and listen and that we need to, you know, there needs to be ultimately a give and take. Um, you know, as somebody who's committed my life to philosophizing and theologizing, um, it's, it's, uh, but also living. I don't, I, I'm not really answering the question. I hear it, I hear it as a strong criticism. And I, I wanna push back and say, what if theologizing is reflecting and searching for patterns and searching for meaning both for yourself, but then having other people listen to you. It's, it's in the act of speaking beyond yourself to have others listen, to hear from others, to try to, um, it's not about finding commonalities so much as it is um, allowing different life experiences to bounce off one another, to shed light on one another, to allow others to help us make sense of ourselves. Um, and for those of us who are less marginalized, it means more shutting up and creating the, the space for the marginalized to speak more loudly, to speak more fully. Um, but it ultimately, I hope it's about finding a balance and um, again, I don't wanna use the word learning. I think it, I, I keep going back to reflecting um, and, and seeking meaning together. Thank you so much, Claire, for that. Um, I wanted to jump in and say, um, I think it's how the theolo theologizing and um, philosophizing Theorizing all of that, um, like the intent and impact, right? So when I'm all, you know, into conversations and, and engagement around, you know, the theology behind suffering, um, as long as it's not weaponized against one community or the other, right? Um, and that happens often. That happens in my own community, and I'm often like, wait a minute, you're using this text to say that these group, this group of people um, is doomed by God because of such and such and such, right? And it happens, right? It happens in our own communities. And I think um, we have to be able to have um, people who are experts in that field and who are respected within their own communities to then challenge, right? Those types of um, ways that people will weaponize theology. And so I think that's, that's an important part of this conversation. Um, and then there's the, the other flip side of this is when you have, uh, and I'm going to name it, right, atheists who are weaponizing this to, to say, well, subtract, you know, God from all of this. And then what, right? So if, so my question back to, to those who weaponize this from the atheist perspective is, there's this this movement to say, well, um, you know, the, you know, if if they're suffering to, to all these different religious people from different backgrounds who are religious and believe in, in a higher power, um, then why is there suffering? And look, religion is the actual cause of why these people are killing each other, but that doesn't necessarily still answer the question and the mystery of why is there suffering, right? In fact, I would argue um, that people who are devout in their quest for finding humanity and, and empathy for, for themselves and for others around them, um, that religion could be, a, could be used as a force of, of good, right? And that theology and philosophizing and having those arguments, having those debates, having those dialogues and conversations can actually be a means to alleviate some of that rather than to weaponize it, I guess. Um, as a non-theologian in the group, a non-philosopher in the group, um, hopefully I can um, add to what has been said already, which I really appreciate. 
Um, the one word I was thinking about, um, Chaplain uh, Tahara, as you were talking, is the idea of theology as a weapon um, or non-theology as a weapon, but that idea of the weaponization of any kind of belief you know, system. Uh, it would seem to me, and I could be wrong because I'm not a theologian or a philosopher, that theology um, and by proxy philosophy that does not take into account lived experience is bad theology. <laughs> um, and I, I'll give an example of, you know, a Christian story, a, a story from the Bible that um, in which you see this idea of the law and the interpretation of the law being um, challenged by the ones who are supposed to be the upholders of the law. So in this case, it's Jesus, is sitting with his disciples and a woman who is not from their particular group, their Jewish group comes and asks for healing. Um, and he says, this is not, I'm not here for you. I'm here for the Jewish people. And she says, well, even it's not a great uh, categorization of, um, of her in this case, but bear with me. But even, um, the dogs eat the crumbs from the table. And the point of the story was that technically based on their law and based on their belief system, this woman did not deserve um, Jesus's service, quote unquote. Um, but in that moment, her lived experience of suffering was valid and deserved a response and deserved um, deserved an answer, a positive answer. And I think about other stories like that um, in scripture. I also think about the fact that historically, um, the Christians in this country, white Christians in this country re removed part of scripture on baptism and freedom because they believed that if the black, if black slaves became baptized and they saw that they could be quote unquote freed that they would um, rebel in some ways or a scripture that says slaves obey your masters. But when I think about that idea of theology being weaponized you know, against a group of people, I think when you look at the lived experience and you say treating people like cattle and their lived experience of suffering um, clearly is not um, a good thing, then you have to go back and challenge what the law that you're trying to quote unquote uphold is doing wrong in that in their narrative and in their story. And I, I think what was lost was this idea of looking at the lived experience of the slaves you know, in this country and, and looking at the lived experience of people. I, I don't like calling people slaves because it's, so, it's antithetical or, you know, to, to our humanity, but looking at the lived experience of marginalized communities that are suffering makes our theology better and validates it. And without that, I don't think it's valid in a lot of ways. Oh my gosh, Dr. Peterson, I wanna say, you said you're the only non-theologian in this group, but that was like such a prophetic, <laughs> prophetic voice. Thank you. Thank you. I think one of the most powerful things we can do with the stories that we inherit is flip the perspective, right? Let's tell the story from the woman's perspective, mm -hmm. right? What did it take to get her to ask for healing? Where where was she in her life? Um, and you know that's a a technique you know that we see in a lot of post colonial literature that you know retells some of the great you know great Western novels from the perspective of the crazy woman in the attic or you know whatever. Um, and in feminist writings as well. And I, I think um, there's no reason not to bring that technique into our, our theologizing and our, our religious reading. I gotta jump in, because I'm what I'm thinking, <laughs> I'm thinking right now of my hometown of Minneapolis and George Floyd Square, which is at 38th in Chicago. And, and that's a real place. And it's become a sacred space. It's cordoned off, it's a sacred space but George Floyd should still be alive. He did not die for a cause, right? A cause has come around it and the space uh, 
has been reclaimed, but it is still a tragedy, injustice, and the space is re is claimed in a different way. But he did not he did not need to die for that to happen. I agree with that a hundred percent. Just because it's really talking about what Claire you were saying too about the perspective that if you're looking at George Floyd as an outsider and you have no ability to enter into that space of who he is as a person and his lived experience, um, then it could it would be easy to make that mistake of looking at it and saying, well, look, it all worked out. So it must have been for a good cause versus his actual lived experience of the of his murder. I think it also connects with, um, it's an illustration of what I was talking about earlier with the sort of the rejection of the idea that suffering is redemptive, right? That, that his death was somehow worth it because of all the good that came out of it. No, it wasn't. Nobody should die like that, full stop. Um, Thank you all for your thoughtful responses to that question. I'm gonna um, add a new one. So this question is, after sitting with who we are, understanding our history and stories, how do we heal, both personally and nationally? I'm glad we can leave the global healing to the side and just do national and for, no, I'm just, I'm just teasing. start uh, in terms of um, healing personally I like to suggest people have a toolbox um, and to think of their toolbox not just in a you know mental health -y kind of way but to think about it as stretching across the breath and you know um, the full scope of who you are as a person and what helps you what um, what are the things that you know, you know, rejuvenates you and gives you energy. And I think Chaplain Tahara talked about prayer and um, spiritual practices. Um, and so, you know, I, I don't always like the idea that our toolbox should be sort of like pre-made and handed to us, but that we do some work to really identify what are the things that feed me and what are the things that rejuvenate me. For some people, you know, going out and hanging out with a bunch of people is not rejuvenating, it depletes their energy. And for other people, um, finding spaces to pray, connect to the divine, in my case, um, my Christian faith is a huge, huge part of my toolbox. Um, when I haven't prayed after um, several days, I start to feel it in my body. And, and so I can't take what's in someone else's toolbox and say, okay, that's what I'm going to use when it doesn't necessarily fit with what my needs are. Um, certainly get help if you um, need support, um, whether from a therapist, a psychiatrist, medications are not bad. Um, we talked about, you know, stressors and, and you know, the external affecting the our, our bodies, I think it's really important to know that that idea of the biopsychosocial spiritual is interdependent on one another. And if you're having psychological pain and suffering, that can turn into hypertension and diabetes and um, and obesity and all. And we have, you know, research, extensive research that shows these things. And that's why it's so important not to really dichotomize ourselves as like, this is my body and this is, you know, my spirit over here, but to really remember that in many ways, when I'm talking about this toolbox, it really should cut across the different domains of who you are as a person and what, you know, feeds you. Because to ignore suffering in a lot of ways does have real consequences. And we know things like racial trauma has a direct impact on, um, on people's physical well-being. Um, so I'll just say toolbox is the starting point and there, there are no restrictions. I mean, obviously healthy things, you know, that should be in your toolbox, but once in a while it is ice cream, right? Or is it, it might be something unhealthy too, and that's okay. 
think one of the hardest things about um, COVID has been the impossibility of escaping the danger. Um, Because part of me wants, you know, if a student comes to me in crisis or emails me in crisis, you know, one of the first things that I will always say that I've been trained to say is, you know, are you safe where you are? Right? Do you need, like, is there an immediate threat to your life at this very moment? Um, and, you know, to encourage somebody to leave the physical space where they are, whether it's to go to a hospital or to leave, you know, to change their living arrangement or whatever. And with COVID, we, short of getting in a, you know, a, a rocket ship and going to a different planet alone, I mean, we, we're here, we're so, we're so in it. And um, I think it's gonna be very challenging for us as a society to sort of emerge from, to know when we are out of the space of danger because we, we can't change our situation in that way. I think it's, I don't have an answer. I just think it's a really a tremendous challenge. Thanks, Claire. Um, and I think, uh, Dr. Peterson, the idea of like the toolbox is great. Um, I think you've really covered a lot there. Um, as I think about what I could add to this, um, would be one, and, and this is kind of what, a little bit of what uh, Claire just mentioned as well around, this is, I think, you know, the first time known to um, humankind um, where every single individual has has a direct threat to their life, right? Like there's a direct threat to your actual existence. So it's an existential threat when it, when it comes to COVID, right? Like no one can just say, well, I, um, I'm you know, fully safe because there are, we know countries going through a second or third wave in ways that are really um, causing uh, not just, it's not just the threat to their life, it's an ongoing existing kind of battle uh, to their health, right? So other areas of their life is, are also being impacted. Um, for me, I, I know that I can speak individually first. Uh, I mentioned prayer before and meditation. I think that, that um, there's actual actual data around how it can impact your brain, right? Like mindfulness. Um, and Dr. Peterson, like you're you're more of the expert in this area. So um, you can chime in for, um, if you know of, you know, like the specific um, work around this. And that trauma associated um, that shows up on, in, in our brain scans and how mindfulness and meditation can alleviate some of that or bring at least some level of healing to that. I think another um, important aspect of all of this is recognizing that there's a lot of mistrust as well um, in some communities around what it means to heal. So for example, if there are communities that don't wanna take the vaccine because there's uh, a legitimate and warranted fear around of whether it's the government or whether it's the um, you know um, this this fear of like this whoever is you know controlling this quote unquote and some of it is conspiracy theory and others I think it's it is coming from a place of mistrust to, to acknowledge that um, but we also know that faith communities have played a role in heal in, in that process of healing and, and education and and um especially like black churches right uh recently there's been a lot of coverage around how black churches have served as a space to acknowledge those feelings and then um and help communities attain better information and why am i sharing all of this because i think it's we know it's a collective it's a collective suffering and in order to recognize that this is not one of those times where if a person chooses not to, in, you know, not to engage or not to take the vaccine, that they they could be a carrier and then just pass it on to someone else, right? Like this is this is you know one of the first times I think in history where what you choose to do individually, you can't just say, well, I'm just an individual and I'm just going to do this, but it has an impact on another person's suffering, maybe, right? So how do we then build allies 
and partners around um, shared information and also uh, being present for those who have gone through centuries of um, what has caused a lot of mistrust. So I think that's part of the conversation too, right? Like there's what the individual could do with the great toolbox that Dr. Pedersen mentioned, um, but then also recognizing some of the, the lingering causes of why um, that pain and suffering continues to, to cycle. Thank you all for those answers. And now we are right up on the end of our time. So with the time of transition that we're all in now with COVID and these vaccines and um, things starting to shift and the stories that are coming out of this shift, um, what is a word or two that you would hope for our viewers to take away from this conversation tonight? I can go. Um, I think COVID, you know, and many of the things that have happened over this past 15, 16 months reminded us um, of the need for, in some ways, our collective energy to its things um, that would be considered suffering for one group and suffering for the other group. I think COVID. I hope is not lost on us in the sense that, yes, some people are saying, well, let's see, you know, we'll be more prepared a hundred years from now or something since the Spanish flu happened in 1918. And this happened in 2020 and this question of being better prepared in the future. Um, I hope that, you know, as people move forward in this time that we're thinking about the ways in which my suffering and your suffering are connected and my recovery and your recovery are connected and that we don't need an infectious disease to, that's contagious to remind us of that. I think it just brought it out some more, but, um, and, and I'll say more directly in how I've conceptualized it, that equity, for example, for black and brown communities as we're fighting for it is connected to, um, to the health of white communities and to combating white supremacy because it's bad for everybody. And, and so I think there are many things you know, that we can map onto that idea, um, whether it has to do with um, religious discrimination um, and the discrimination we saw after 9-11 against Muslims in America, um, but that to have a better world for my children, for Claire's children, for anyone else's children, we have to deal with this this suffering that seems like it's, you know, marginalized as we use that word to just black and brown communities. When in reality, it's creating a ticking time bomb for all of us as a society that we can't sustainably live in peace together um, if we don't deal with it. So. It's gonna be you know, a journey moving forward. I hope people don't forget some of the things we've gone through over this past year as the vaccine rollout is going really well. Um, and I hope people care for themselves. Obviously as a psychiatrist, I'm always um, seeing situations where people delay care. Um, so caring for yourself is really important. Practice radical self-care because you know, that the two most significant commandments, and I'll end on this in scripture, in the Bible, in the Christian story, is to love God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And I always like to remind people that the idea of loving your neighbor as yourself is that you have to love yourself first in order to know how to love your neighbor. <laughs> and, and so really practicing self-care because that's the only way you can care for others. Yeah, I'm just sitting in what you just said, Dr. Peterson. I was, um, I really appreciate those words and 
think radical self-love and radical self-care and uh, collective impact for community, I think is um, really awesome. You should totally write about this. Like, <laughs> you know, this, this whole idea that you just put together around um, or shared around collective suffering and how COVID just allowed us to see that for what it is and how we're also interconnected. So thank you. I think those are all profound words. And um, I am thinking of the, how do we balance love, forgiveness, justice, all of those things. Um, and I can say that I, what faith communities have to offer in these spaces is that there is an immense recognition of forgiveness, right? There's an immense recognition of restorative justice. There's a uh, recognition of um, kind of what Claire said earlier about um, how suffering is not necessarily, you know, just for redemption, that there's an element there to that's welcoming of the kind of righteous anger, right? Um, all of those, I think we sit in all of those realities. Um, but I feel like as a chaplain and, and Reverend Kristen, it comes from, right? The, the root word comes from this idea of cloaking someone, right? In their time of need. Um, that's where I am right now, right? Is how do we cloak those in their time of need, but then also think about self-care, right? So. Yeah, thank you so much, all of you. I want to say that you all um, help me and help our community hold hope in tandem with reality. Both things exist at the same time. And thank you so much for this conversation.